I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am privileged to be recording this vodcast today, the Gimui Wulabari Yidinji people of the Gimui, and I would like to recognize their elders past, present, and emerging. Welcome back to another episode of the Growth Distillery here from tropical North Queensland, and I have the absolute delight to introduce Jane Caro, uh, Order of Australia, um, yes. prolific Australian commentator, uh, and you and I are here to have a chat about storytelling. So to kick things off, I'd love to get your take. What's going on? How have you seen storytelling change for the better or the worse, I might say, um, over the last couple of years? It's really interesting. I think there's been a real explosion of creativity in the area of content. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that, for example, you know, the last episode of Succession was last night and (laughs) I sat up late and watched it. And those sorts of really high quality, really interesting, really pertinent, wonderful stories are uh, in TV series format longer than we've mm. ever had before um, have just taken off and the whole world's fallen in love with them. So mm. content has really um, taken to brilliant high quality storytelling and it's storytelling that's at the core mm. of the success of that. So we've recognised that. Films still catching up but there's some good films out there. Novels, um, long form articles, are really, you know, catching up with the idea of storytelling as the core human communication vehicle. Unfortunately, I think advertising's lost its way completely really? on okay. telling a story. Uh, and certainly when I look at the, and I don't see a lot of ads, and mm. that's revealing too, uh, because if I am watching free to wear, I can fast forward or mute or get, get rid of them. And if you're watching the Netflixes and things like that, there are no bloody ads. Mm. But when I do see them, they're boring and I want to fast forward through them. Yeah. But the challenge for advertisers and those who create ads is you need to make me want to stop the fast forward. And sometimes, once or twice, and I can't remember the ads now, so I can't tell you, I have gone, oh, what's that about? Yeah. And gone back and watched the bloody thing. But most of the time, I see nothing of interest. And why do you think that is? What are the forces that you think are shaping, in particular, you know, that that dichotomy between as you said long form you know immersive content through Mm. film and particular tv this renaissance of tv that has happened over the last sort of five odd years relative to you know to what you and i were talking about earlier the sort of the stagnation of advertising creativity i think it's because something really important has been forgotten in the scientificization don't think that's a word i just made it up but anyway you know what i mean of um audiences. Mm. So we've turned people into data. Mm. And the problem with turning people into data is we think we're talking to data, to numbers. And so we don't think of telling a story. We don't think of engaging. We don't think, we think about what do we want to ram into this data? Mm. What selling point do we want to make? Mm. What, you know, product benefit do we want to ram home? No, people aren't interested in that. They don't want to be sold to. Mm. They want to be... I often use... I used to teach advertising creative at the University of Western Sydney many years ago, and I used to say to my students, you need to seduce your audience. Don't rape them. And most of the ads I see are trying to rape the audience, and the audience are very good at avoiding that. And one of the ways you seduce an audience is you put them first. What is the person because there's only ever an audience of one that's Mm. the other problem with data it makes us think of audiences as great masses of numbers Mm. no one person with one brain watching listening responding that's all the river is and if we think of that person we think okay how do i tell you a story which includes the message i want to send you whatever that is in a way that will interest, engage, and involve you. Mm. I'm hearing things from Martin Sorrell about, oh, you know, if all these advertising messages are going to be uh, absolutely uniquely tailored to each individual person. We don't need to do that. And the content television series prove it. In Mm. fact, all that will do is annoy people. 
I get supposedly tailored ads to me now, except it's imperfect at this moment, most of them, because I'm a woman of 65, say how to get rid of unwanted belly fat. Yes, I do want to get rid of unwanted belly fat, but not as much as I want to eat. So I'm not going to get rid of my unwanted <laughs> belly fat. That's just the way life is when you're 65. Stop sending me those bloody ads, but they do. Mm. So we we know how to talk to each individual person. Let's tell a great story, get the emotion right, mm. and everyone will respond to it. Hello, Succession. Hello, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Hello, Mad Men. When did we lose that insight? Yeah, there's a, the, the, what you're saying is, I think, a profound observation, and it, it reminds me of a really brilliant quote. You know, we're, we're seeking rational measures to describe the absurd. Yes, right? yes. And inherently, we're, we're emotional beings and we're this sort of, you know, illogical tapestry of, of emotions, right? So then, in your mind, what's the antidote to this, you know, as you put, put it, you know, the scientification of, of um, and, the, you know, the where CMOs are having to become CTOs to keep up with all of the technology that, that holds them to account? I don't know. I, I think eventually we will the scales will fall from our eyes and we will recognise that we've fallen in love with the hammer and the nail and forgotten the house mm. that we're trying to build. Um, uh, we're, so, we're so in love with our, our cleverness in creating this technology um, that we've become besotted with it, almost, almost mesmerised by it. And eventually we will learn to take more of a distance and understand it better and be more casual about it. I think audiences already have done that. Mm. They are choosing what engages them and they're not interested in any of the other stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think those who are trying to control audiences, and that's also a mistake, trying to control an audience is always a fool's game. You can't do it. Mm. That's the rape strategy. Our job is to, to enable and facilitate their journey. And to, and to seduce and to um, draw them in by sharing our humanity. Mm. As Ian e. Forster said a long time ago, long before t this kind of technology, only connect. Mm. And that's exactly right. But don't connect through the interwebs or electricity or technology. Connect emotionally. Mm. We will get back to that eventually. But it's like we're scrambling to keep up. It's the same as our legal system is struggling to keep up with technology. Mm. Uh, the laws come out much later than the actual problem that they're meant yeah, to fix. Yeah, this consistent game of catch-up. Yeah, catch-up, catch-up, catch-up. And I don't have a particular answer to that. All I do is stick to telling stories that I believe engage emotionally and that I want to tell. And now I do it in books and articles and things like that because I don't think there's a room for me in advertising mm. anymore. The sorts of ads I used to make, which are almost always narratives and stories, um, I just don't see any of that anymore. I think that's a shame. Yeah, okay, so then I'm gonna put you on the spot. Give me an example and you've given a couple in TV, in TV and mm. film, but maybe something that's a little bit more adjacent, maybe in a category that people wouldn't really think brilliant storytelling. Give me an example of gold standard storytelling. I think sometimes you see it actually on the internet from very ordinary people who tell a story about something that's happened in their life. And maybe they tell it and the rawness of that emotion mm. because something wonderful has happened to them or something terrible has happened to them. And it can be a Facebook post. Mm. It can even be just a tweet or a tweet thread sometimes or something on Instagram or whatever it is, TikTok often. Just some person who's caught up in something that really moves them to mm. the core of their being and they just tell that story um, as honestly and candidly as they possibly can. And those are the things that often go viral. Mm. And they don't do it because the person wrote it to go viral. Yeah. They don't do it because the person's tried to manipulate anybody into responding. They do it because the person has opened up and shared something real, genuine and raw, precious. We sort of understand the fragility of what they're telling us. And we respond to that with the same thing in ourselves. And that is the gold standard of storytelling. And every good storyteller knows that what you have to do is you have to actually risk opening, tearing open your own guts. Mm. This is professional novels, novels. This yeah, is yeah. Jesse Armstrong. You know, you tear open your own guts and heart and you put it out on the table and you hope that by doing that, you connect with other people's hearts and mm. guts and viscera. Yeah. Um, that's why we call it visceral. Mm. Um, and I think the data, the obsession with the tools rather than the message has put such a cold distance between the storyteller and their audience mm. that that's what's missing yeah. and that's why the connection's not happening. 
So if, if you're a, an advertiser or a marketer and, and you're trying to you know, work with your team and reconnect them to, that, to the fabric that is gold standard storytelling, what would your advice be to those organisations and those practitioners? Uh, it would be go out and absorb as many stories as you can. Um, and think about why is this a good story? Why am I responding to it the way that I am? Why does this make me cry? Mm. Why when I go, go to the old fashioned cinema occasionally, go and sit there in the dark and watch a movie. And a comedy is a really good one. Sit there and watch a comedy with a bunch of other people. Look around before you sit down. Notice they are not divided by demographics or gender or age or any of those externalities that we obsess over, which mean nothing. Mm. They're just a random bunch of people come to see a, a funny movie at the cinema. Notice when they laugh, all at exactly the same moment. Mm. Why? Because that's good storytelling. Mm. Good st go and watch a comedian, stand-up comic, do their shtick and watch the way that audience of very different people all guffaw at exactly yeah. the same moment. What that proves beyond any research report or any data or any bloody I don't care is that we are humans and we are the same. We are much more the same than we're different. And focus on that. Think about how did that stand-up comedian make that laugh happen right there. And some comedians like Hannah Gadsby yeah. in Douglas basically gives us the whole way she puts together her stand-up show. Go watch that a million times. That tells you how to tell a story. That's mm. what she's brilliant at. You've touched on something that I, I fundamentally subscribe to, which is I think that we've... We've also got this fixation on segmentation, right? And that I think, you know, we try to divide ourselves into smaller and smaller subsets yeah. relative to looking at the opposing end of the spectrum, which is what's the connective tissue that sits across our Australian psyche? Yeah. Um, is this something that you're also seeing play out? And, and again, what, what might be the antidote to the conventional wisdom of marketers and advertisers, which is find a segment within a segment and, and speak to, it's not know, to unique needs. It's not conventional wisdom. It's conventional stupidity. <laughs> um, I have fought against segmentation and dividing up audiences all of my professional life. Mm. When I first started working in marketing and advertising, it was when they, they first decided to call my generation the boomers. Mm. Before that, no generation had had a name. Funny mm. that. Yeah. Um, then they had to name them. And this was all about advertising and marketing. And it was all about advertising agencies putting together a product that they made up to sell to clients to make more money. That's mm. how it started. Yeah. Then researchers realised, oh, this is, you know, we can get into this. And look, for psychologists, there may be uses in categorizing people and working things out but when you're actually trying to seduce them mm. you need to get to the thing that makes us all the same and that is our feelings i used to do an exercise with my students and sometimes i do it um, with um, professionals and I, I get them to put up 50 life experiences and i make them do it from the most banal like I don't know, brushing your teeth to the most extreme, like being a suicide bomber, just putting up all these experiences and we have a lot of fun with it. Then I get them to put up 100 emotions and they come really quickly because they're all single words. And then I go through the 50 life experiences, I read them out and I say, count up in your own head how many of these you've actually experienced. Most people, depending on their age, 25 to 30 of them. Then I count up all the 100 emotions and I say, count up in your head as I read them, how many of these you have actually experienced? And everyone's only one answer, 100% of yeah, them. Yeah, 100 of 100. All of them. So we concentrate the segmentations, all of that, con even they call it psychographics. We concentrate on the things that are exclusive to us, our mm. life experiences, and that make us different from one another. We reject and pay no attention to the things we all experience. And the connective tissue And the connective us. tissue, yeah. which is... What may have caused me pain in my life will be different from what's caused you pain in your life. But we both know what yeah, it feels like to feel pain. pain. Yeah. And so it's, I think it's because we're afraid of emotions. I think we're still a highly masculinized society and mm. part of the poor way we've, we've created masculinity sometimes mm. is this repression of emotions, yep. this feeling that they are dangerous and, and must, not be, must not be named, must not be allowed to be expressed and certainly felt repressed hard. Mm. And I think we have to get over that because that is freezing us into these isolated places. Mm. And it's 
I mean, and that's devastating and tragic, but we're also wasting shitloads of money. Yeah, it's exa- it has to be exhausting yeah. not being able to, you know, to be your authentic self. To, and exactly, so many people are pretending. Mm. And, and, I, and, and when you hear people talk, and particularly when I hear young people talk, and they talk in those buzzwords, those, you know... Mm. Um, they put structures up in front yeah, to protect. Yes, yeah, so there's all this kind of uh, uh, consumer insights and blah 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 mm. words. I think... You're pretending, you're playing a game. What do you really think? Mm. And the very best salespeople, and in the end, advertising and marketing people are glorified salespeople. That's what they're doing. The very best salespeople are believers and enthusiasts Mm. and their belief in what they're selling really comes across. And that really connects with people. Mm. And in fact, the very best salespeople are often the easiest people to sell things to. Mm. Because they are a bit of a believer and enthusiast. We've lost that. We've got this sort of cynicism and coldness. And we've been looking at, and I've said this many times over decades, I fought it in client meetings. I've almost always lost. Can we stop treating the people we're talking to as some sort of biological specimen that we're examining through a microscope? Mm. This is not conducive to good communication Mm. and I think you know again you've you've hit on something that really resonated with me which I think the fundamental objective for brands is to find people who believe what they believe yes yes and the point of brands is not to have everyone love you because Mm. everyone only loves you for a short time Mm. that's what fad brands are about Mm. classic brands realize that if they tell their story as truthfully and as candidly and with as much humor and humanity humor and humanity are so closely connected Mm. human humanity and honesty as they can they will attract the people who will enjoy their brand and continue to buy Mm. it and that in the end is what people make the most money out of loyal customers Mm. but we have tossed aside the loyal customer i mean watch the abc i love the abc it is so important to me but it is chasing the false god of youth Mm. People don't watch free-to-air television anymore if they're young. And even people don't want to watch at 40 the TV station and the TV programs they were watching at 20. Mm. They don't want to drink the drinks they were drinking at 20. You will get the young when they're a bit older. When they catch up. (laughs) They they will not be on forever. And when we segment by age, it's the most foolish segmentation of all because most women remain women for most Mm. of their lives. Yes, I know we have transgender and all of that, but that's a very small proportion mm. of people. Most pe- people of co- people of colour will stay a person of colour, person who's white will stay white, etc., mm. etc. Et if you were brought up in a certain class background, you were brought up in the, that class background, no matter how you move through society, part of, your fiber. part of who you are. But your age will change. Mm. It changes every second and you will be old if you're lucky enough yeah. to live that long. So when we define the young like this, the middle-aged like that and the old like this, mm. We're, we're cutting it's human beings. It's, 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 we're dismembering human yeah. beings. No, they're all moving through those stages all of the yeah. time. I think the challenge is populations move at a pace that is glacial relative to marketing thinking. Yes. And in our never-ending you know, thirst for growth, we, to your point, we just don't let them catch up. We need to remember that success is a long-term objective. Mm. It's not a short-term objective. Yep. Short-term success is almost always an illusion and and never lasts. Jane, it has been an absolute delight having you on the Growth Distillery. Thank you so much for taking the time. Have a wonderful time up in tropical North Queensland and I can't wait to chat to you again. Oh, it was great fun. Thank you for asking. You're very welcome.